So, hi everyone. Thank you for our live participants for joining us and welcome to those of you who are watching our recording. My name is Jing Yue Ma and I am a executive coordinator for EBC Psychi external team and I will be your host for today's event. Before we continue, however, I would like to begin with an land acknowledgement. Some of us may not be physically on campus, but EBC Saikai operates on EBC's infrastructure, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. If you'd like, please add your land, please add your land acknowledgement to the chat. And today's event is the Saikai's expert, expert Talk Theories. Saikai is one of the most largest international honor societies in the world with the purpose of providing academic and professional development opportunities for our students. In service with this goal, we're here at the UBC chapter have to let the Expert, expert Talk Theories, a bi-weekly event where we invite professionals in the fields of psychology, cognitive systems, and behavioral neuroscience to share their advice, experiences, and insights with EBC students in those fields. And today we are honored to welcome Virginia Trier. Uh, Virginia began her MA in counseling psychology at the University of British Columbia in 2019 with the aspiration to support international students in higher education to build a sense of belonging and well-being using culturally sensitive, strength-based approaches for resilience and empowerment. Her current thesis project focuses on the belonging of international students on campus using a photo voice as a participatory, participatory um, approach to research. She's certified in teaching mindfulness mind meditation and period, periodically runs workshops to teach basic mindfulness skills to build compassion, self-awareness, and emotional regulation. She's also integrates ecotherapy and eco -psycholo psychology principles and is working towards facilitating for spathing workshops for university students. And I would like to remind our participants that if at any time during the talk you have any questions for Virginia, please type them into the chat and feel or feel free to raise your hand and we will address them right away. Now with the formalities out of the way, I'd like to hand it to our speaker, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you, Jingwei. Thank you everyone for joining and welcome. I'm very excited to be here, and uh, you know, if you get a researcher to talk about their research, it can it can go on for hours. I'm going to try today to really be brief, and I've created a PowerPoint to help explain some of the main themes that were developed uh, through this thesis that you heard named, uh, which was a photo voice project involving international students uh, here at UBC. So I'm just going to take a moment to uh, switch the screens to that. So. I will stop sharing that one and go to the PowerPoint here. And I'm trying to click on that button. So just give me a second here. It's not. There it goes. Start at the beginning. Okay, so like this talk is entitled, uh, People, Places, and Power, the Need to Belong for Psychological Well-Being. And these are the three main uh, aspects I'll be talking about today that were lessons learned from the, the research. So before we begin, I just wanted to take a moment here to share a little bit about myself, other than what you just heard in the, the biography. And the way I'll do that is actually through this photo, uh, which is a photo of my home. And uh, it's actually literally quite the view from the front porch of my family home. And I'm from Iowa in the US. And so I am an international student here at UBC. I arrived in 2019, just before the pandemic kind of uh, closed things down on that end. Um, but I just want you to take a moment and think about first, like what comes to mind for you when you think of the word home? Um, you know, you can take a moment and picture it for yourself and uh, think about what that might look like, where it might be for you, and also the sense that comes up for you. So for those of you who are looking at this photo, you likely don't have very much sentimental value attached to it. Um, but for me, it really draws very warm feelings and good memories uh, from my associations with my home. 
And so these are kind of the things that we'll be discussing uh, in terms of what the other international students had to share. So today I'm gonna to try to, like I said, be brief, but also cover the important details. So we're going to go through some of the background on the photo voice study. The idea of what need for belonging really kind of means for us. And then the impact that I saw and was really spoken about the most, which is people, places, and the role of power for belonging. And then, you know, I just want to take a moment here to also point out that I want this to be useful for you as students in terms of both like the kinds of research that might be available for you, especially in terms of my field, counseling psychology, but also in terms of your personal experiences with belonging. So even if you're not an international student, there may be aspects of this that I hope you'll find uh, useful. A little bit about the study purpose. Here we are asking the question of when or where do you feel belonging on campus specifically? So I really wanted to take my thesis time as an opportunity to explore things that I was passionate about. So you probably noted that part of this was a personal exploration uh, since I am an international student and have experiences of my own in that way. And also just in terms of how we ask the questions being very important in terms of both the social justice aspects of research and the application and influence with the participants that you're working uh, together on a project as opposed to kind of just on them. So those are two components that were behind the study for me personally. And therefore, I really was looking to address some of the gaps in the literature, looking at a vehicle for students to explore and assess their own belonging from their own perspectives. And then in addition to that, contribute to what I saw as a much needed strength in international students, a uh, strength-based perspective from the students. So those are kind of the foundations for that. You might be wondering kind of like, you know, some of the background assumptions here for this study. So I'm gonna quickly go over this slide, but it is quite an important component to the ideas in the study. So one of the assumptions that it holds is that knowledge is co-created. And I just added some quotes here from kind of the theories uh, that under uh, are the undercurrents to my research here. So I'll let you kind of read those on your own time. But generally the idea is that there isn't one single truth that we are kind of like talking about here. It's really this interrelationship of me and the participants and our environment that is creating this knowledge that we are talking about. So it's very interesting in that sense. And then there's this idea of seeking a good life. So this is in terms of well-being. And so the assumption here really is that every person is already living out the answers to the question, what constitutes a good life? So I'm not assuming that well-being means this. And if you fit it, you have it. And if you don't, you do not have it. So this conception is more, again, allowing for a construction of well-being and the good life. And then finally, the community knows best. So this assumption is what brought me to Photo Voice. It has this community-based aspect to it that really looks at the members of that community as the ones who are most viable to produce the solutions and to address the specific contextual needs. So who was on this project with me? And you'll start to see here some of the photos that were uh, created during this project. And I used them a little bit more creatively in this presentation, uh, in part because there's such an, the main foundation of the research. I wanted them to be present on most of the slides. And then also here, I thought that this one in particular really spoke to, you know, that we did do the study online. And so this was kind of our world at the time, right? So it really is showing the context of, of working together but in total, there were five students who were able to complete the whole uh, photo voice project. Um, everyone lived on campus, including myself. This was one of the criteria. And then uh, we also had students who were from various um, identities. So um, four identified as women and one identified as a man, and these are self-identified. And then generally from these uh, different regions coming from, and also multi-country. 
So just to give you a little peek inside who, who were really the members of this project. And just to note, because this was a thesis study, I had ethical uh, priorities for privacy and confidentiality. So all of the photos are shared with permission and the names and everything are given with permission as well. So you'll see that going through. Okay, so back to the study here, photo voice. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, if you're like me, you may not have heard of this. It, it's more up and coming. It's generally uh, in the health fields, not so much in psychology. However, uh, there are examples of psychology using photo voice to really explore generally like marginalized populations because it has such an aspect of using that community voice and the uh, action steps to address community needs. So it has what I put up here, the participatory action research and the community-based research. So that's where it's kind of couched in if you go to look it up. For us, we follow generally these five stages. Again, I'm just gonna breeze through this, but generally what took place is that we had a meeting, we were trained about photo voice and belonging, and the guidelines for taking photos were de developed collaboratively with the participants. The students then on their own took photos to try to answer the research question, when or where do you feel belonging? And based on the prompts that they described as where you might feel home, uh, what home feels like to you, what belonging means for you. So it was very open for them to explore their daily experiences through photography. We came back together as a group and discussed the photos and they chose their most meaningful photos to share. And in addition, they really took uh, the meaning uh, was given by the co-researchers. And so I, and in my role, do not look at the photos in terms of data analysis, Rather, it's the descriptions and the documents and things like that. So if you're curious about that, I can talk more about it. But you'll see here in the analysis and narration, it kind of has two sections. It has the narration given, hence the voice part of photo voice, by the students about their photos. And then it also has a reflexive thematic analysis so that I could, as a researcher, kind of communicate the findings to my field. So those are the components of our study here. And Ultimately, there were 24 photographs that were combined with narratives and captions that were presented on campus in November. So there were three locations that targeted the audience that the uh, co-researchers really wanted to focus on, which was their peers at the time. So that was the photo voice study. So now we're gonna look a little bit more in depth uh, into the idea of belonging. And when I say the need to belong, what I'm really getting at here is that it's a kind of like considered a biological need as is food and water and love. And it has been very well researched actually in terms of what happens when you don't have belonging. So Baumeister and Leary have the need to belong theory where they've really shown over decades that when you are rejected, when you are not able to access this valued relationships, the social sphere, uh, it leads to not only a sense of isolation, but depression, physical illnesses, and even potentially at an extreme end has been correlated with uh, suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior. So essentially meaning that it is a huge threat to not belong. So conversely, uh, you know, this study kind of takes that understanding that belonging is a need, that it's a motivation. Um, it's not something that you can't have. So in other words, everybody is seeking belonging. And so again, for me looking at it through the strength-based perspective, like where is it or when is it? Um, you can see that that allows this kind of determination that's very individual, what it looks like. So I Here's the picture in the background from Hannah and a quote from her as well, kind of describing this photograph and saying that food is often the love language and the sharing of the meal in essence is a way to show affection. So just taking a moment to kind of like think about that, like how this aspect of daily life distinguishes and cues you into this fact that you have a little moment of belonging 
So uh, what belonging here is not, you know, it's, <laughs> it's really seems to be easier in research to say that you can't have like what it is to not feel belonging and also what belonging is not. It's very more difficult to say what it is, right? That's that individual aspect. But I do want to point out that these are also kind of coming from the study together is really pointing out that it doesn't really feel like conforming. In fact, conforming was a negative kind of response uh, to not feeling belonging, right? So there was also the idea that generally speaking, when you belong, it's by being in a group, which is like part true, but also it's not the full story, it seems. And finally, uh, this is a big theme throughout, um, was that belonging, especially, wasn't really considered like a destination. And one of the collaborators said that it wasn't a light switch. You couldn't turn it off and on, right? So those are just kind of getting into ideas of the need to belong. So conversely, uh, belonging and well-being. Uh, I put up here a quote that I thought was appropriate for this type of study, which is again, is naming psychological well-being as the combination of feeling good and functioning effectively. So that really leaves it open to what good means, right? But generally in measures uh, that have been studied with well-being, it is very beneficial. So not having it hurts, having it is leading towards well-being, leading towards thriving. And in the student context, of course, that means then more motivation, more academic success, um, and a protective factor actually against some of the loneliness and suicidal ideation that I mentioned before. And there is another aspect to it that I might draw on a little bit more, which is this idea of empowerment. And so we'll kind of touch on that in later slides. So here's the, the meat of the study and where I wanted to spend most of the time. I'm sorry if I'm going very fast, but here we're starting to look at examples of the photo voices. So one of the main themes, of course, was people and the impact of people. And people is a general category. Specifically for us, it seemed a lot, of, a lot about friends and friendship. Remember, this was during the pandemic uh, context last year. So the students were living on campus. They had access in that sense to their residence. Most of the buildings were still closed at that time. And classes, of course, were all online. So just keep that in mind, but um, this is a quote from Sanjana and I will let you kind of just read that here. So you can see in this quote, one of the kind of key roles that people can play, friendships in particular, is this idea that uh, you have someone to talk to and to count on, someone that feels comfortable, that feels like home. So this is like a deeper layer than just someone to have uh, fun with, although that is also important in this study, but just having their presence uh, signifies a place where there was this comfort and safety. In addition to kind of that aspect of like a, that role of friends, almost like a family, was the role of friendships in the sense that they were uh, available and you could have a group of people that you shared similar things in common with. So this is a photo from Thomas and he's describing how the students can really bring together uh, other students from other countries, which creates this routine sense of interaction. And through somehow this routine interaction, it really started to be another cue of having that sense of those valued relationships, that need for belonging was being met in that way. So again, it is, there were many more wonderful photos, but here's another one uh, that's showing uh, a gathering and so uh, it's just entitled uh, Leaving Our Shoes at the Door. And it was about how this unspoken aspect really signified kind of this understanding that made it easy to connect uh, to others. So in summary, 
for us in the photo voice project, there seemed to be this role of safety and comfort, kind of like a family, an entertainment of pleasant experiences, those shared uh, interests. So those are also through games, through sharing meals, um, through going to places together. And then this, uh, with that sharing, uh, there was this re reciprocity. So having a value that you are sharing, but also having that received. So that added like a layer of depth to those experiences. So it wasn't just every time you're with somebody, but the ones that were named in the study that were most important seemed to be about receiving and sharing values. And that could go either way. So either you received it and you're very grateful for it, uh, some moment with your friends or you shared something important and they received it and it's not nothing has to be huge again it was like one example is like a card game but there was meaning behind that um, connected to family and connected to enjoyment so I'm going to move on here to our second uh, theme which was really uh, the most kind of important part of doing photography study was understanding this spatial aspect of belonging. So what came out of that was really fascinating for me. I hope it might be unique or interesting for you as well. But first aspect of it was this idea of home and symbols and what I um, am quoting in here in fit. So I'll explain that a little bit more. But this was the aspect that like being in your environment uh, could feel warm and welcoming. So there was a relationship in that space and not just with the people in that space, but like literally with the components of that space and the objects. So acting kind of as these symbols. And I thought Sanjana just uh, said it here really well. So I'll just kind of read her statement. She said, all of these objects I have, have a story behind them and I have accumulated these memories over the years in my many homes. I find it interesting how my current home is created with the memory of my previous homes. And this just reflects on how the new feeling of belonging for a person is somewhat connected to the old feeling. So again, there's this interplay between our memory, our emotion, and our physical environment, and how that's telling us that we are warm, like happy, and we're welcomed in this space. Another critical kind of component, especially here at UBC, we're very, very lucky in that sense, uh, is nature, right? And so nature seemed to fill more of this role of soothing, uh, not always, but generally speaking here. Um, and so I put, it's okay to take it slowly. And so we have two different uh, components here about place. Uh, one is the internal soothing. And, and so that's like, I'm able to connect to my home. So that's like ocean on the horizon here. Uh, Danielle is saying, I feel the ocean grounds me when I feel adrift. Wherever I am in the world, water is everywhere. It reminds me that although I'm far from home, home is not another world away. And so you can see how she's really using this aspect of connecting again her conception of home and seeing it where she is and being able to really utilize that in a way that's beneficial for herself. Whereas on the other side here, uh, we have Dunye with a sense of connection to the natural world constitutes part of my belongingness. So in here, it really seemed more the focus is on that moment of interaction with nature, with animals and having a value that's represented in your environment. So noting that there was this value of environmentalism on campus that seemed to be uh, respected and reciprocal with an internal value of, of nature. So in that way, we have this idea that, and I see people are joining, so welcome if you're joining. Uh, we have this aspect of place again being utilized almost like dosing yourself in a sense with like positive emotions. So you have these places that you know seem to connect you in some way to help you feel that sense of soothing or comfort or whatever it might be, uh, opens you into this aspect of either uh, a community sense of feeling like you have a place here on campus 
uh, that is safe for you and comfortable. So uh, places certainly were often described as warm and welcoming, but I also wanted to draw in that they were not always. So belonging and certainty is a concept that I wanted to just name here. And it is the idea from Murdoch and Pieria at uh, 2019. So I have citations at the end in case you really want to know. But essentially is that when you transition to a new place, there is a lot of this questioning of belonging that occurs, especially for students or pretty much anyone who may have more reason to not belong. And I kind of put that in, in quotes because there is a great body of research about aspects of marginalization, uh, stigma, uh, feeling like you are discriminated, being actively discriminated against uh, racial stress. So there is way more that I cannot cover in the study, uh, but I do want to respect that field. And so part of this questioning can be more important for students who have a reason to feel like maybe they are not welcomed here. So I just want to point that out quickly, but I'm sorry I can't cover that uh, more in depth right now. However, what occurs next is generally thought of searching for cues in the environment. So searching for signs of respect and inclusion kind of like as you are. So not inclusion in terms of like morphing into something else, but seeing your faculty, your classrooms, even pictures, diagrams, restaurants, just pretty much anything in your environment. And we're really constantly assessing what is it saying about if I'm welcomed here? Uh, so there's the searching for cues and then an assessment, like I was just getting at, positive assessment, generally the cues in some way tell you that you fit. Negative assessment can be othering, it can be explicit, and it can be implicit. So this example of a photo shows how disconnected we can be from each other, is the quote by Hannah. And you can see even, perhaps you have a visceral reaction to like seeing people walk away from you. And you know, how uncomfortable that is, you know, to feel like you're not, uh, like you can't see their faces, you can't see them smiling, you know, you're feeling really the sense of rejection. So places have this ability to both be beneficial for us and they can also be very uh, unwelcoming, whether it's explicit again or implicit. So finally, there was kind of getting into the sense of like the role of power. In terms of the photo voice study, this was an undercurrent that seemed to arise through the ideas of agency and access. I put some quotes here. There's more than I'll probably read, but you can kind of start reading them yourself to really hear again the voices of the co-researchers in terms of these categories. So what agency looked like uh, here was like, we make these spaces our own. And that was referring to like creating your own room creating that home, those objects that have meaning for you. It also had a sense of agency that you could um, interact with something and it had an impact. So you were able to influence your environment and your environment had an influence on you in a positive way. So there's this interaction of agency there. And then there's another aspect of agency that had like an internal mindset component in the sense that there was this possibilities, this hope that seemed available. So the last quote there was like, you can be the sky and you can be anything. And that's talking about this photo over here by Danielle, in which she used this as a metaphor to really show this idea that, um, you know, between the blue sky and the green trees, she related to the blue sky. Um, blue, however, as she told us, was not very common in nature other than the sky and the ocean, right? Uh, so she showed the blue more to show that that was like her having a place, like that was her place that she was creating this metaphor that she can be anything and she doesn't need to change and she doesn't need to um, not be herself. So I thought that had a lot of uh, power to that, those statements. And in that, that kind of gets into the claiming belonging. So that last quote there is also about that picture. As time progresses, I've come to realize that being different does not mean that I'm any way inferior and others around me are not superior. 
So there's this claiming of belonging that seemed to benefit the process of belonging on campus. Conversely, uh, you know, when the opportunity was not available for people or places, there was, especially if this quote is about the pandemic, we didn't get the opportunity to meet new people. So this is showing how the control over the environment is really then comes into realms of power. So who has control over the environment? In a university setting, it is largely not the students, <laughs> to be blunt. The students have agency and the more agency they have, the more likely it seems to be to access these ideas of belonging presented here. However, sometimes when the access is denied or prevented or like a, the avenue is cut off, then there was some of those uh, feelings of loneliness, isolation, uh, depression, uh, feelings um, that can happen from the research. In this study, there was a lot about the struggle of international student experiences mixed with the struggle of the pandemic, but also the sense of, you know, wanting to be able to uh, improve and grow. So I like this quote a lot, and I'm almost done with the presentation. I hope I'm not taking up too much time here, but I did want to add in this quote because I, it shares kind of a personal conception of what I think the role should be for the university. So this idea that um, the university has that control over the environment more than the students, and therefore it is their ethical kind of obligation uh, to provide those opportunities and to actively engage in the concern over their student's sense of belonging. And if they do not do so, I, in Strayhorn's words, they can conspire to the academic failure of their students. So it has some harsh consequences if not able to access that need to belong. This gets at this idea that belonging is really a community concern. So going back to the beginning where Photo Voice is a community-based project, the students were looking at belonging in terms of their daily experiences, but also naming what could be done about it for the community or for other students. So I really do wanna encourage this idea that with the role of power, that belonging is a community concern. And I would even go so far as to promote that well-being and mental health is a community concern. So what I mean by that is that there's the individual responsibility and just like a community, there's like the community sense as well. So we are in relationship in this world with other people. And so there is this um, idea that to address uncertainty of belonging, we need to promote the explicit message of cues for students that they are welcomed here and to promote a community of practice, which is a phrase essentially meaning that the students can share their experiences with each other and learn from them. And in that there's agency and ownership built. So leading to that, I wanted to end today with the words from the co-researchers in this study, uh, which is really guidance that they wanted to share with others. And for me, as working with this study for, for many, many months, I have to say that it was very heartwarming to spend my time with these students' words because it really showed this care that I don't think is very accessible in our world today. I think that we generally get a lot of messages about division, which is real and important, um, but it, there's also this side of caring and concern that was just very heartwarming. So I'm very, very grateful to have uh, been able to work and collaborate with the students uh, at UBC. And I hope while I've been talking, you've been reading what they were saying. So these are the aspects of the community engagement that we can share to others. In summary, belonging is complex and dynamic, uh, but it seems in the study that there is this growth aspect so it's possible to learn and grow through your experiences. If you don't belong at first, it's okay. That was one of the statements from the other slide. 
Belonging and well-being are not one thing, but con totally constructed. And so therefore, it's not really a question of if one belongs, but how. Thriving and well-being involve the agency to access meaningful places, as I talked about, and especially that is this reciprocal nature where we can really have an impact and build ourselves um, into the environment where we are. And I'd lastly, again, just promoting this idea that showing respect and demonstrating respect is showing a value of diversity. And this really strengthens the application of equity, diversity, inclusion, which is a huge component, of course, um, at, at UBC and in general um, in this world that we live in now. So creating these opportunities to belong is one pathway for building student well-being and student success. So with that said, I forgot to start my timer. So <laughs> I will stop here and I'm happy to fill in the gaps of any of the slides that I went over or any of that information about belonging and well-being. So maybe I will stop sharing here, but I'm happy to go back to the slide if someone would like. Hi, Virginia. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to present today. I think, uh, Jingwei, if you would like to lead the Q&A and conclusion now. Um, we do have a few minutes left for the participants here. If you would like to stick around and ask some questions. Um, Virginia, of course, uh, at the discretion of your own time, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, take it away, Jingwei. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we can select some of our Q and A questions for for Virginia. So the first question is, um, um, what was your counseling practicum at SFU like? How did that influence your academic and career decisions afterwards? Yeah, yeah. So for uh, those of you, yeah, who didn't know, I did complete an intensive summer practicum in counseling psychology. SFU, so that's working with the students there on campus. Higher education is clearly my focus, and I just absolutely love that stage of life. And so I kind of already knew what I wanted to do beforehand. I really knew the population I wanted to work with. So this is, uh, it wasn't so much that I was influenced by the practicum itself, but it kind of confirmed my pre-existing notions that this is the group of people that I really am passionate about. And it gave me a lot of experience with student issues, right? So especially during the pandemic, <laughs> my counseling was all virtual. So maybe one thing that influenced me was that I would really love to be in person <laughs> again for that. But it uh, is a both a good environment to work in, but also very challenging because systems systems are complex and universities are massive systems. So on one hand, you have a lot of access to services and well-being, and um, you, know, you can really have your populations right there on campus. But also I learned from that experience is that within the system, it's really hard to change it. And it's really hard to sometimes Kind of even what I was talking about, feel that fit within it. And so always with systems, that's kind of that tension there between wanting to improve it and also wanting to work within it. So I guess that's what I would say. I hope that makes sense. I would certainly love to work in higher education. So that is my <laughs> academic uh, intent or career intent after. Thank you for your answers. And if we don't have any questions from the participants, then we can go for that last question here. That is, what does, were the main skills that you took from your experiences as an academic research and teaching assistant working at UBC? 
And would you recommend this experience to other students and why? Mm. Yeah, I, I think for those who want to go into counseling psychology, it's a very important decision to consider is if you want to do a PhD level to a psychologist, or if you just want to kind of do the practice. I personally am a very uh, theoretical person. So I loved combining both, but it's very, it was very difficult to be both a researcher and a practitioner. It's, it's not easy to do both of those things. So I think uh, it really helped me see the theory and also the, like doing the study and belonging. I really am glad that I chose something that I'm personally passionate about. And that might be the one message that I really wanna share is to really, if possible, encourage students to choose research that they are passionate about because you spend hours and hours and hours. Basically the last two years have been devoted to doing this research. And so I gained a lot from that research because I was passionate about it and because it relates to my academic and career choices. So I really encourage students to try to align, if you know already uh, what that is for you, to align those things in advance. I had a lot of time outside of school between undergrad and my master's to do a lot of searching and figuring out what it is that I enjoy. So when I did my teaching assistantship, it was also involving international students. So I work at Vantage College at UBC. My original intent for the photo voice project was to do that advantage, but then we had the pandemic. So I would recommend certainly to try to align the experiences with your passions so that therefore your work isn't for nothing in a sense, like it builds your pathway. And, um, but it, it is certainly a lot. So I would also encourage students to like, if you don't want to do research in counseling psychology, you certainly, uh, I would avoid the MA path and just do MN. Yeah. yeah. I think it's so lucky for you to find a project that you really care for it and it really contributes to, to the community. I mean, that's a yeah. part of honor to like participate in in the study. <laughs> and so that's our time for today. I would like to give a big thank you to Virginia for the insightful presentation and excellent answers to our questions. We really appreciate the time you've taken to share with us this amazing project and we look forward to collaborating with you again in the future. I would also like to thank you all for all the part, all the students for participating, asking questions and showing your support for the series. Thank you also to Saikai marketing and leadership teams for making this event possible. If you were, you were um, watching the recording at a later date, we would like to see you at our next event, which will be in the Thursday evening, April 7th, about um, a speaker from uh, University of Toronto. And once again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Virginia, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.